turn the floor over to our uh, study group co-chair and member of the Commonwealth North Board of Directors, Mead Treadwell. Mead? You're on mute. You're on. There, that's better. Hi, uh, I'm Mead Treadwell in Juanetta, Ayers, thank you. I was a deputy commissioner of environment in Governor Hickel's cabinet. And uh, we got an invitation from the State Department to join uh, the US delegation to a meeting of the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy. Uh, we sent uh, Dr. Luis Proenza uh, from the University of Alaska to the signing of the strategy. And then I attended working groups. Uh, people in Alaska, and especially in the legislature overseeing my budget, didn't think uh, behaving in this way of traveling to international meetings on the Arctic made a whole lot of sense. So they kept cutting my budget whenever I went, but we kept going anyway. We managed to get a number of things happening and that group became the Arctic Council in the mid 1990s. The purpose of today's program is to talk uh, with uh, several participants in the Arctic Council process and uh, help us figure out uh, from this Commonwealth North study group what recommendations we might make uh, for improvement to the Arctic Council process. And I would suggest as you hear these guests, think about ways that we can continue to build upon the cooperation for better environmental uh, uh, cooperation, better economic cooperation, uh, better cooperation directly across the Bering Straits, uh, where we seem to have lost a lot of the communication that we had in the neighborhood, uh, better cooperation between Alaska and Washington. And uh, so uh, we'll get started with introductions, but before I do that, I'd like to thank uh, and welcome uh, Lieutenant Governor Kevin Meyer, who's joining us this morning, and now introduce uh, our guests. Uh, Dr. Mike Sprague is founding director of the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., uh, an organization which I co-chair their advisory group. He is also director of the Global Risk and Resilience Program at the Wilson Center. He's an Alaskan, a geographer by training, and his work focuses on the changing geography of the Arctic and Antarctic landscapes, Arctic policy, impacts and implications of a changing climate on political, social, economic, environmental, and security regimes in the Arctic. We are joined again by Ambassador David Bolton, who's a senior fellow at the Polar Institute. David served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries at the Department of State and attained the rank of ambassador in 2006. We heard him talk about Arctic Ocean policy recently, but he, uh, for a long time, coordinated US foreign policy concerning oceans and fisheries, as well as Arctic and Antarctic issues, and oversaw US participation in international organizations. During the last US chairmanship, he was chairman of the senior Arctic officials. Uh, Gail Schubert is president and CEO of Bering Straits Native Corporation, is also a member of the Board of Commonwealth North and a co-chair of the study group. Bering Straits serves 17 villages in the Bering Straits region. She's a Nupiak, was born and raised in Unalakleet. And in addition to serving as C president and CEO of Bering Straits, she serves on the board of the Alaska Federation of Natives, the Alaska Native Justice Center, the ANCSA Regional Association, the Iditarod, and the Native American Contractors Association. She is also a member of the Arctic Economic Council. She has served on the BSNC Board of Directors since 1992. And our last speaker today will be Dr. Liza Mack. Uh, Liza is uh, uh, the Executive Director of the Aleut International Association, one of the permanent participants in the Arctic Council process. And Liza is Aleut, born and raised in the Aleutians and has over 20 years experience working in and around native organizations and communities. Her PhD is in Indigenous Studies at the University of Alaska, uh, Fairbanks, and she's taught courses as an adjunct professor at UAF. Uh, the Aleut International Association uh, represents the Aleut people that live both in Russia and the United States in the Arctic Council. And just before we went on, she was uh, letting me know that there are four board members from Russia, four board members from Alaska. And uh, I look at the, their organization as one of the great enduring bridges of cooperation across the Bering Straits. With that, I'm going to hand the program to Mike Schrager. Dr. Schrager, thank you very much for moderating today, and uh, we'll go forward. 
Thank you, Mead. Uh, Winetta, thank you as always for putting these together and for, for uh, supporting us. Mead, thanks for the kind invitation to participate and thanks for your leadership at the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center. Um, instrumental in, in not only creating the idea, but now helping me and us to move forward. So thank you all. And thanks all to Commonwealth North members for, uh, for taking the morning to talk with us. As Mead noted, all of the speakers have particular expertise and involvement in issues surrounding the Arctic Council and then uh, issues that are complementary to the Arctic Council. So what we thought today would be helpful since the Arctic Council has come up a couple of times in Commonwealth and North discussions is to walk through with all of you what the Arctic Council is, what it does, um, what equities the state of Alaska does have in Arctic Council discussions uh, in the work that they do, uh, how that will grow here in the future, uh, the pressures on the Arctic Council, frankly, on the frameworks that were built a couple of decades ago and now with a new Arctic, uh, does that translate to a, a new uh, framework perhaps or list of themes and issues that the Arctic Council considers and what role does Alaska play in all of that? We also thought it'd be very important to hear Liza speak about uh, the permanent participants, which is a very different dynamic for this kind of a, a consensus uh, generated group that uh, has our permanent participants, indigenous peoples uh, within the group, influencing and informing the dialogue within this international organization. And we certainly thought there's a perfect Venn diagram with having Gail join us because of not just a relationship, obviously with the state of Alaska and, and working on this policy group, but also thinking about the ways in which the Arctic uh, needs to draw capital and venture and sustainably develop infrastructures and communities throughout the North. Those things to, to me is, are a perfect Venn diagram for a discussion, all of which inserted throughout the dialogue should be, uh, as Mead noted, a, at least some thoughts about Alaska's uh, role in all of these organizations in the work that they do and what equities do we have but what does our future like and how do we inform and influence the dialogues about the way in which the Arctic is changing and our roles in all of that uh, for now and into the future, especially with the transition from a chairmanship of the Arctic Council that is now held by Iceland as we transition, as Dave will point out, in uh, just a few, few months down the road to Russia uh, in May of 2021 when they take the chairmanship. Uh, and there might be some interesting opportunities there uh, because of our, our shared border and our heritage and our neighbor uh, taking over the, the Arctic Council. So with that, uh, let me turn the program over to, to Ambassador Bolton, Dave, to give us a, a short history, but also sort of the inner workings of, of the Arctic Council as well. So with that, Dave, I'll turn the floor over to you and thank you again for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, thanks to uh, Mead Moneta and other friends at Commonwealth North for this opportunity to speak with you once again. I think I'd like to try to share my screen. I have a few slides. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so as uh, Mead and Mike have said, I'm going to give you a sort of once over lightly um, tour of the Arctic Council. It was created in 1996, uh, based not on a treaty the way a number of other international bodies are, but just a declaration that was adopted in Ottawa. It um, started modestly, it didn't get a lot of high level attention in the early years, but over time has some picked up momentum. And today is generally recognized as the premier international body that deals with circumpolar Arctic issues. Um, whoops, Let's move forward here, there we go. Uh, here you see uh, just a, a few random pictures. Uh, every two years, there's a Arctic Council ministerial uh, the picture all the way to the left is from Kieran of Sweden in uh, 2013, the one in the middle from Iqaluit in um, Nunavut, Canada, um, and uh, in the one on the right in 2017 in Fairbanks, Alaska, there's uh, Rex Tillerson chairing the final meeting of the U.S. Chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, the Arctic Council actually has an extraordinarily broad mandate that our, uh, the Ottawa Declaration speaks of common Arctic issues, uh, pretty much every, anything you could conceivably imagine. The main focus of the work has been on sustainable development programs and projects and environmental protection programs and projects, but those are not, th those don't actually capture all what the Arctic Council does. Uh, when the Arctic Council was created, there was only one topic that was um, 
uh, taken away from it or is uh, not, not part of the mandate expressly, and that is military security issues. If the nations of the Arctic wish to talk about them, and it is kind of an issue these days, uh, it can't be through the Arctic Council, at least not as currently configured. Um, I don't need to tell this group that there are eight Arctic states. Those are the uh, official members of the Arctic Council, the United States, Canada, Russia, and the five Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, and Denmark. Um, yes, there are uh, six groups of Arctic indigenous peoples represented, so-called permanent participant groups, the Arctic Council, in addition to the uh, Aleut International Association and Lies Max group, there are the uh, Arctic A Athabascan Council, the Gwich'in Council International, uh, Inuit Circumpolar Conference. Uh, all four of those, of course, have strong participation by Alaska Natives, plus uh, the Sami, Sami Council uh, from Scandinavia, and then a kind of composite group from, of all of the Russian Arctic indigenous peoples of the North, so-called Rypon. Um, the fact that the Arctic Council includes Arctic indigenous peoples at the table in their own name and right, and that basically participate in uh, decision making as though they were um, uh, not part of uh, any national delegation is what makes the United uh, the Arctic Council unique in my view. It, it lends to the Council a certain legitimacy and uh, authenticity it would not otherwise have and that no other international forum I'm aware of uh, does as well. Um, here's a a busy slide uh, uh, that actually dates back to the U last time the U.S. chaired the Arctic Council from 2015 to 2017. I won't go through all of it. Um, what you need to know is that the chairmanship of the Arctic Council rotates every two years among the eight member states. Uh, as I said earlier, the foreign ministers for the U.S. and the Secretary of State uh, attend those meetings regularly. Um, at the ministerial meetings, the work that has been underway for two years is brought to fruition and a uh, new plan is laid out for the coming two years of uh, what the Arctic Council will focus on. Uh, below the ministers, each country is represented um, in the Arctic Council by a senior Arctic official and they oversee the day-to-day -day work or at least the week-to-week -week work of the Arctic Council as a practical matter. Um, I wouldn't bother with the two task forces that um, were in play back when the U.S. last chaired the Arctic Council, but what does remain are these six standing working groups at the bottom of the slide uh, that have been around since the dawn of the Arctic Council uh, that actually do really the bulk of the work that the Arctic Council does. These are um, programs and projects, hopefully of benefit to people of the North, also uh, uh, analyses and other studies, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, uh, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, other other sorts of work that the Arctic Council's put out that really does uh, shape policy making um, in the circumpolar north. The Arctic Council uh, does not have a war and peace on its agenda exactly, but I would say that it has, through the cooperation that it has generated over the last, especially over the last decade, helped to keep the peace in the Arctic, something that is uh, uh, particularly valuable now. It is a place where the Arctic countries and the Arctic and the peoples of the Arctic can go to work together on common issues, even while there is friction, lots of friction, about other parts of the world and about other issues. And indeed, the Arctic Council, for that reason, has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, something that's uh, sort of interesting to me. Um, hmm. Go ahead. Uh, there are many who have wished to sit in Arctic Council meeting as observers. Uh, there are three groups of observers. One are the countries of the, uh, outside the Arctic that have interests in the Arctic, and all the red on this uh, map are those countries that have attained Arctic Council observer status. A lot of countries of Europe, south of the Arctic, um, now a growing number from Asia as well, China, Japan, South Korea, India, even Singapore. Um, in addition to the non-Arctic states, there are a whole raft of intergovernmental organizations like the International Maritime Organization, others that have become Arctic Council observers, and many non-governmental organizations as well. Some of them are environmental groups, some of them you know, represent, uh, for example, the um, uh, Reindeer Herders Association, 
uh, a whole raft of people. There are now more than 40 different Arctic Council observers, thanks in part to the attention that uh, the Arctic is getting and the fact that the Arctic Council is uh, recognized as the premier place to deal with circumpolar issues. The Arctic Council, a, generally speaking, has no authority to adopt rules that are binding on its members. However, the Council did serve as a venue for the negotiation of three treaties in the last decade. And I just mentioned them here for those of you who were um, on, uh, on the, at the meeting the last time I spoke, I talked about these at length. But it is at least possible for the Arctic Council to, to do this, to form task forces to negotiate agreements in these cases on search and rescue and marine oil pollution and on science cooperation. I would say the strengths and capabilities of the Arctic Council, there, um, it does now get very high level participation from all of the Arctic states, um, for a bit of media attention as well. Compared to a lot of other international fora, it's relatively flexible and non-bureaucratic. Um, can take up things uh, pretty easily and produces high quality work often. Um, yes, as I mentioned, the inclusion of the Arctic indigenous peoples has uh, been a strength. And yes, I, already, I guess I already mentioned the Nobel Prize nomination. Um, so I'm actually a big fan of the Arctic Council for what it is and what it, uh, for what it does. But there are also a number of limitations and challenges. Um, the fact that, generally speaking, it can't adopt binding decisions and, uh, creates problems of uh, sort of um, accountability. The governments who agree to things at the Arctic Council don't then need to demonstrate that they actually have carried out the commitments they've made there. Um, and a number of people have pointed out that this uh, is a limitation. Um, the financing for the council, it really does operate on a shoestring budget and financing is also not all that predictable. So it's hard for the council to plan far out, not knowing how much money it's going to have, say three, four years down the road. And it's not always the most transparent in the way it works, particularly um, the meetings of the working groups are not open to the public. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people on the outside curious to look in and uh, without that, really an ability to do so. And of late, the Arctic Council is facing some particular problems. Mike alluded to uh, these. Uh, the last time the ministers met um, was uh, at the end of the Finnish chairmanship in May of 2019, and they could not reach agreement on a declaration to uh, sort of chart the course for the, uh, for the two years we're actually in now, the Icelandic chairmanship. It was reportedly because the United States could not accept language on climate change in the declaration that the other seven all wanted to see. Um, be that as it may, it has left the council uh, politically somewhat adrift and there are people worried about that. And it's um, exacerbated, exacerbated this, this, the dynamic by a growth in friction among or between Russia and the other countries, particularly Russia and the United States. Um, so-called great power competition. And the fact that we're in a global pandemic at this point has made it difficult for the council to obviously can't meet in person. Um, and uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, virtual meetings of the Arctic Council, though they are going on, have their own challenges of connectivity and time zones uh, that people who live in Alaska know all about. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, Alaskan engagement uh, in the Arctic Council and its processes. And it, it has ebbed and flowed over the years. I would say it started slow in the early years, but then built up fairly steadily. And during the US chairmanship, uh, there was a lot of engagement, not only by the state government of Alaska, but uh, Alaska industry groups, civil society, Alaska you know, think tanks, different kinds, all were very much engaged in the US and chairmanship. And we, uh, some of the US program during that chairmanship was to take uh, initiatives that were underway in Alaska and sort of try to make them circumpolar in nature to show off what Alaska was doing and try to use its best practices uh, to become Arctic Council projects. And that was, these were of course led by Alaskans, um, uh, I, I would say to good effect. My impression is that uh, since the end of the US chairmanship a few years ago, there has been some significant drop off in the participation by the state and I would, 
uh, like to see uh, sort of a, a reemergence of that engagement. And particularly as, as Mike and Mead were saying earlier, uh, with Russia taking over as the chair next year in, in May, and with uh, good relations, at least among some groups in Alaska with their counterparts in Russia, uh, there might be opportunities for Alaska and Alaskans to get more involved, more involved in the Arctic Council in the coming years. Um, there has been, oh, I don't know about tension so much as differences of view between the federal government and the state government about Alaska's role in, in the Arctic Council. If you were to ask a federal official to take a hell, if you were to ask me a few years ago when I was at the uh, State Department, I probably would have said, the Arctic Council is an international body under the US Constitution. The federal government is supposed to lead US participation in international affairs generally. Um, and that US interests in the Arctic, though there are many of them relate to Alaska, not all of them do. So with the United States as a whole has interests in the Arctic that are not directly tied to Alaska. And what I heard from my Alaskan friends were, the United States wouldn't even be in the Arctic, but for Alaska. Alaska should have a seat at the table in developing, you know, um, U.S. policies for the Arctic, and in particular needs to um, be engaged at places like the Arctic Council uh, as a vocal part of a U.S. delegation. Um, that kind of debate strikes me as largely theoretical and quite manageable. As a matter of practice, I think we did find ways uh, successfully uh, to give Alaska the kind of voice in the Arctic Council that it has sought. Um, and uh, for the most part, we're able to, to, to work together as strong partners, the federal government. Okay. I see no reason why people of goodwill could not continue to find, to find such, such types of uh, cooperative uh, ways of working together in this. Anyway, that's, that's what I have to say for now. I know there are other people who are eager to talk. I should have probably gone on too long as it is, so I will. I will shut up now and stop sharing my screen. Dave, that was great. Thank you very much. There's a couple of things. I, we'll come back after all the speakers have, have had a chance to, to talk. Uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to follow up with you on, especially this uh, opportunity, we'll, we'll call it, uh, with Russia taking over the, the chairmanship. That was one, so uh, put that on your docket. The second is just the, 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 uh, the pressure uh, on the Arctic Council, even without a pandemic, to sort of grow and think about its structure and its strategy going forward, even the be even in the best of times as the sort of Arctic accelerates in a whole different number of areas. So it'd be good to get your insight on that one. Uh, next next up is uh, Liza Mack, Mead introduced. Liza, I want to thank her again for uh, participating here. I think this is an important component. I think an underappreciated component. Nevertheless, having permanent participants at the Arctic Council, they do inform and influence the discussion. Uh, and, and Liza represents one of those important organizations, uh, not just for the Arctic Council, but also uh, giving voice to the indigenous peoples and what, what their role is, not just in, in their own communities, but internationally. And most unique is that Liza re represents an organization that is cross-border. It is international and includes our, includes our Russian neighbors. So this will be a very interesting discussion. So Liza, I'll turn it over to you. And just a heads up, I have a few questions that I may pitch to you after you speak at the end of this, this discussion. So it's, it's a, okay. the, the virtual yeah. floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Liza Mack. I am um, Aleut. I was born and raised in um, King Cove, which is at the end of the Alaska Peninsula. I currently serve as the executive director for Aleut International Association, which is one of the six permanent participants of the Arctic Council. Um, Dave, thank you so much for uh, that introduction to the Arctic Council. I think that that, um, that helps me to uh, kind of illustrate what actually goes on at the Arctic Council and the role that we play as a permanent participant um, within that organization. Um, I just have one, uh, not really a slide, actually just a photograph that I would like to share with you guys here. Um, and this, uh, this is actually just a map of the permanent participants of the Arctic Council and the geographic area in which um, the Indigenous people live. Um, so you have the Inuit Circumpolar Conference, um, ICC, which is 
located in four different nations, the United States, um, Green, uh, Greenland, Canada, and uh, Russia. Um, and then uh, you have Arctic Athabaskan Council, which is in Canada and the United States, uh, Gwich'in Council International, Canada and the United States again, um, you have the Sami Council, which is actually located in um, four different uh, nation states in the uh, Scandinavian area. That is Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. And then um, Alia International, of course, is uh, with, we have our, we represent our, our cousins in uh, both Russia and Alaska. Um, in order to be recognized as a permanent participant of the Arctic Council, you have to be an indigenous group that is um, cross-border um, in order to be eligible to be recognized at the Arctic Council. So you have to be one indigenous people that is represented in two different countries, or you have to be um, more than one Arctic indigenous people in a single state, which you see with RIPON. Um, they represent, RIPON actually represents, I think, over 40 different indigenous groups in Russia. Um, as we move forward with the chairmanship, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council moves um, every two years. Uh, we are currently in the Icelandic chairmanship. Uh, with each chairmanship, we have different, um, uh, that nation state puts forth their agendas and puts forth their goals um, of things that they would like to see accomplished within that time. Um, within that two years of their chair. Um, we are excited to actually be moving to uh, Russia, as it's been said, we have, um, we certainly have been working with our uh, board members there. My board is comprised of uh, four Russian Aleuts and four Alaskan Aleuts. So um, a lot of the work that we do and the projects that we are involved in um, have that international um, goals that are international and things that uh, we wouldn't necessarily uh, be involved in had we not had conversations with uh, people on the Russian side as well. Um, Dave mentioned that there are observers who would like to be involved in the Arctic Council, um, and there really are. As we see the climate changing and the Arctic um, opening up, we do see a lot more interest in the Arctic. And so for us as an indigenous organization, as a permanent participant to the Arctic Council, we sit in a very unique position as we have, uh, we have a seat at the table, rightly so, um, to inform the, the senior Arctic officials and the different uh, people who are involved in working groups of the Arctic Council. We uh, come in with our, our traditions and our culture and our ways of knowing that aren't necessarily, aren't a Western, a Western viewpoint. And so the things that we provide at the Arctic Council are certainly, um, certainly ways in which uh, what's happening at this international level is affecting uh, people at the community level. We see a lot of issues around the circumpolar north that are um, unique, but they're also, um, they're also, you see them all, they're, they're common. They're common and they're unique in that you have the same issues in rural um, Canada and remote Greenland that you do see in rural Alaska as well. And so for us as permanent participants, bringing those kind of illustrations and the ways uh, that we live and the ways that um, that our culture informs how we live is, is really uh, unique and important. Um, I think that one of the, one of the opportunities that we have as permanent participants is the fact that uh, our constituency doesn't change. Um, a lot of times with nation states, uh, those, the people who are on, that are serving on the working groups and uh, within the senior Arctic officials, sometimes those change. And so one of the things that we have in our favor is the fact that um, our membership is continuous. And so um, being able to bring that forward and to have that um, institutional knowledge that couples with the cultural knowledge that we have as an indigenous people, I think is a unique opportunity to um, 
to uh, build that dialogue that we need to uh, make sure that the things that we're doing, the policy that is being set that affects us um, is being voiced. So I'll just leave it there with a wait for questions from you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Liza. That, appreciate that. I, I do have a couple, but you know, more importantly, I'll, I'll put it up to uh, the members of Commonwealth North right at the end of the discussion. Um, if you could, let's see, unshare, there we go. Um, although the map was far better looking. Uh, thank you for that, Liza. We'll get, I, have, do, I do have a couple of questions, but uh, I think Dave and Liza has, have, set up the, have set up Gail uh, very well for her, her participation now as a speaker. Uh, you all know Gail full well, but she's also a U.S. member, uh, US, um, a member of the Arctic Economic Council, uh, a council now that is um, one of the legacies, a good legacy of the, of the Arctic Council. The Arctic Council, as Dave pointed out, um, has enabled a number of international binding agreements. It has spun off, in a good way, uh, a number of efforts. One has been uh, the University of the Arctic. I see Diane Hirschberg, I think, is, is online here. Uh, many of us have been involved with the University of the Arctic almost since its inception. So that's one or circumpolar organization that has legacy and does very good work around the North. The second is the Arctic Economic Council, which is what Gail will talk about. Uh, this is a group that looks to uh, enable, uh, looks to advance Arctic economic development uh, in all segments, uh, doing it in a responsible, sustainable way. Uh, and in particular, Alaska does have, in my opinion, a lot to gain from a robust partnership with other members in the Arctic Economic Council, especially when we look at our own challenges here in the North. So Gail, with that, I will turn the microphone over to you to talk about uh, the Arctic Economic Council, and perhaps you can also talk about the unique relationship there in the region that you represent. Good morning. Uh, thanks for asking me to participate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Arctic Economic Council, which was created during in 2014 during uh, Canada's chairmanship of the Arctic Council. And the purpose of the Arctic Economic Council was to facilitate Arctic business to business activities and responsible economic development in the Arctic. The AEC has five overarching themes, and they are to establish strong market connections between the Arctic states, encourage public-private partnerships for infrastructure investments, promote stable and predictable regulatory frameworks, facilitate knowledge and data exchange between industry and academia, and also to incorporate traditional indigenous knowledge, stewardship, and focus on small businesses. The Alaska Arctic Economic Council members are Thomas Mack, Lori Davey, and I. The Arctic Economic Council is open to corporations, corporations, partnerships, and indigenous groups that have an economic interest in the Arctic. The AEC legacy membership includes three business reps from each Arctic state and three reps from each permanent participant. There are five overarching themes that the AEC adopted. Um, the first is to encourage a public-private partnership for in infrastructure investments, create stable and predictable, I've already gone through the re regulatory frameworks and uh, the other three I've already gone through. There were seven sectors that we focused on in the working groups. Uh, the first was infrastructure and related matters, including marine transportation, communications and IT, aviation. Uh, under responsible resource development, um, there were uh, um, mining, oil, gas, and renewable um, matters that we focused on. Arctic stewardship, uh, incorporating traditional knowledge, stewardship, and enterprise development, also tourism, fishing, human resources, investment and capacity building and traditional Arctic livelihoods. We had our inaugural meeting in Canada, um, Equality Canada on September two to three, um, 2014. And our purpose was really to facilitate um, Arctic business to business activities and responsible economic development. 
at the time, uh, there were 42 business representatives and six indigenous organizations that were part of AEC. In 2015 to 2017, we established priority, priorities that included um, collaborating with renewable and non-renewable energy, energy sector experts in the Arctic to understand the energy needs of Arctic communities, developing best practices guidelines for Arctic en ener energy development, making recommendations on how to address Arctic energy needs, including costs and sustainability, maximizing and balancing Arctic development with environmental stewardship, working Pan-Arctic to streamline regulatory processes to encourage responsible resource development in mining, oil and gas, and renewable resources. We focused on infrastructure, tourism, and marine resource development. Um, with regard to uh, telecommunications, our focus was on access, assessing Pan-Arctic capabilities and gaps, cataloging economic development opportunities, developing strategies for promoting communications infrastructure through economic development, supporting Arctic Council's Arctic-wide telecommunications infra infrastructure assessment by serving as the telecommunications experts group needed to meet this goal. On marine infrastructure, uh, we advocated for increased marine infrastructure, Pan-Arctic, that also contributes to food and border security marine transportation, safety, protection, and procedures. We cataloged economic development opportunities, and we also work to develop partnerships at the local, state, federal, and international levels to enhance tabletop full-scale live exercises and search and rescue capabilities in the Arctic. And we also uh, looked and um, discussed port development. In response to uh, response operations, we established partnerships with and support uh, from Arctic, the Arctic Waterway Safety Commission. We also uh, worked on search and rescue, food security, spill response, and situational awareness, which includes vessel tracking. Uh, with regard to tourism, we worked on showcasing the Arctic by member state, raising public awareness about the tourism opportunities in the Arctic, and served as a public resource to access opportunities in the Arctic. For marine resource development, we developed partnerships with the fishing industries within each member state. We identified import export barriers and uh, worked to construct solutions and opportunities. And we also looked at traditional um, marine resource activities. So in terms of the timeline, um, the AEC was created in 2014. In 2000, April 2015, the U.S. assumed chairmanship and populated the working groups. In September 2015, the Secretariat opened in Norway. In April 2016, the organizational structure and founding documents were adopted by the members. In July 2016, there was the first Top of the World Arctic Broadband Summit in Barrow, Alaska. In January 2017, the Telecommunications Working Group report was released. In February 2017, the first non-voting member joined the Arctic Economic Council. In May 2017, the Finnish business community assumed chairmanship and there was an election of a new chair and executive committee. In June 2017, the second Top of the World Arctic Broadband Summit was held in Finland. In December 2017, the Arctic Economic uh, Council event was held in Korea, and the topic was marine transportation and connectivity. In January 2018, there was a publication of the Arctic Business Analysis and Arctic Frontiers. In April 2018, the Governance Committee met in Helsinki. We had our annual meeting in Sweden in May of 2018. In June 2018, we had the third Top of the World Arctic Broadband Summit in Sapporo, Japan. In 2019, we adopted a new strategic plan. And in um, 2020, things at least for Alaska have slowed down and the um, Arctic 
Economic Council is now uh, advertising for a new executive director. Our longtime director has um, decided to move on. So in, on October 9, 2019, the Arctic Council and the Arctic Economic Council signed a memorandum of understanding providing a framework for how the two can enhance cooperation and collaboration between them. The Arctic Council and the AEC then held their first joint meeting in Reykjavik. This brought together for the first time the government reps of the eight Arctic states, business reps and reps of the indigenous permanent participants and the AEC and AC uh, working group reps. Uh, the step towards enhancing cooperation and collaboration between the Arctic Council and the AEC uh, has, um, has moved forward and we're looking forward to seeing uh, what else comes of that. And finally, we postponed our May 2020 annual meeting uh, because of COVID. And just with regard to Bering Straits Native Corporation and our involvement in uh, Arctic development, um, we own a rock quarry in Nome, which we uh, hope will provide all of the hard rock to build the Nome port, which uh, is finally moving forward. And uh, we just received title to Port Clarence. Um, which includes an airport and other assets. Um, and uh, when Shell pulled out of the Arctic, they gave us a, a set of uh, anchors that we intend to set next summer um, at our own cost of about a million dollars. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Gail. Really appreciate that, very comprehensive. It's also uh, pretty impressive. Uh, that uh, so much has been done forming, forming and providing a strategy for the AEC in, in a very short period of time and, and a, what I consider to be a really healthy uh, partnership with the Arctic Council. Uh, and it's nice to see that uh, I think what you've drawn is a lot of on-ramps and off-ramps between uh, the state of Alaska, the, the, the interest that we have and how those relate to the Arctic Economic Council and their agenda, because you can take off every one of those from telecommunications to roads to infrastructure to sustainable development on and on and I would sense that that the overlap would be pretty significant in terms of what the AC is trying to do and, and maybe what our state needs and what our aspirations are as well so thank you for that uh, Liza thank you for uh, providing an insight into the permanent participants and Jack uh, and, and Dave uh, you you providing the groundwork and the framework for the Arctic Council as well. At this point, uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, so I want to be uh, conscious of that. Also, I want to make sure, maybe I can ask Juanetta, do we have any questions from the members that they would like to put up before um, I either ask Mead or I ask uh, the, the presenters here to follow up on a couple of things? Sure, Mike, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, first one is actually uh, pointed to Dave. Um, the question is, uh, do you pre predict that the parliamentary standing of the Arctic Council will change under the Russian chairmanship, uh, in, a, in essence, uh, given the rapid change in the Arctic, do you think that, um, and, and, and access to the Arctic, do you think that the Arctic Council will be able to establish and enforce treaties? Wow, that's a lot to unpack there. Um, the Russians have not yet um, presented their proposed program uh, for their time as chair of the Arctic Council. They're actually supposed to do so next month. So it'd be a lot easier to answer that question a month from now than today. My guess is that the Russians will want to focus on uh, economic development issues, particularly in its part of, uh, of the Arctic. They're keen to particularly develop the uh, Northern Sea Route and further and uh, offshore oil and gas stuff where we know, we know that. Um, but they um, have not tip their hands as to whether they want to change the council itself in any way. There have been efforts in the past to try to uh, strengthen the council from time to time to create a long range strategic plan for it, for example. And it's possible that under the um, Russian chairmanship, there may be some progress on that if the Russians are willing to put some energy and leadership behind it. Um, funnily enough, despite all the tensions between the US and Russia over the last decade, uh, the U.S. and Russia have collaborated pretty closely on a lot of things going on in the Arctic Council. And it's possible that while Russia is chair, there may be opportunities for the two nations, again, supported by people in Alaska, to help push the, uh, the council in positive directions to deal with the changing Arctic. 
Yeah. And Dave, while I've got you on camera, this the second one is probably for you as well. Has any state or organization ever been denied observer status? And, uh, you know, what would be the compelling reason as to why? Um, I don't know that any has actually been denied, but some who have applied have not been accepted as a subtle distinction. And the, for a number of years, uh, countries in Asia, and particularly China, had sought observer status without obtaining it, but then ultimately uh, an understanding was reached in 2013 that allowed China and a number of others to get observer status. And the other curious situation is about the European Union Although there are EU member states like Italy and UK and France that are Arctic Council members, the EU as a whole, I'm sorry, the Arctic Council observers, the EU as a, as a whole wanted observer status and was first blocked by the Canadians uh, for reasons related to uh, marine mammals and now is essentially blocked by Russia for reasons related to sanctions. Um, so the EU just has not yet actually obtained observer status officially. Um, but that's a, just sort of a curious uh, quirk or an anomaly, I would say. Most everyone who has sought observer status has ultimately gotten it. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have for now. I'm going to turn it back to Mike to. Uh... Sure. Uh, Mead, uh, did, did you want to ask a question? Because now would be a good time, and then I'll come back to the speakers. Sure. I, I guess one uh, question I want to ask quickly, David, is uh, what uh, what did we ask observers to the Arctic Council to do? Did they did we ask them to invest in the Arctic? Did they uh, were they to work with permanent participants and and uh, if you could lay those out and then Liza, I'd love to hear from you and from Gail. Uh, how has that worked out? Are we getting enough love, so to speak, from the observers who get to come to these meetings? Uh, well, I'll try the first part of that. Um, there are a set of criteria for considering observer applications. And one of the criteria is that they uh, would be observers need to uh, respect the role of indigenous peoples of the Arctic and their particularly their participatory roles in the Arctic Council. Um, the Arctic observer, Arctic Council observers typically actually want to do more than the Arctic Council members are comfortable with. Um, they often want to exercise perhaps greater influence over Arctic Council processes and members and some of the permanent participants are comfortable with. So for example, some of the observers uh, have deep pockets and are offering to pay for things. Uh, and yes, uh, the Arctic Council does accept some money from the observers, but uh, there's one rule in place that no particular project within the Arctic Council can be funded more than 50% by an observer on the thinking that you know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. So there is an odd, there's an odd relationship with the observers, uh, many of whom strive to do more. The Arctic Council needs their resources and expertise and ideas, but is also once trying to set some limits, participatory limits. And there was a time, maybe Elias can speak this better than I, where the um, indigenous groups, the current participants were worried that if there were too many observers, it would have the effect of diluting the the, the voices of the permanent participants within the council. Um, I heard that, and especially in my early days working with the council. Liza? Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think um, in, the, in the time that I've been involved with the Arctic Council, we've certainly been um, approached by uh, different observer groups. And, uh, and I mean, just like every other uh, organization, they come forward with their own agendas as well. And so it's, it's, um, it's been a way for, uh, certain observers are definitely more active than others. Um, I think that I've heard Singapore mentioned earlier and they are certainly active in um, inviting indigenous uh, permanent participants and indigenous people to Singapore to, um, and they've offered to pay for different kinds of training and so on. Um, and then there's also been, um, you know, partnerships with different uh, observer groups as well. That 50% uh, caveat as far as projects go um, is certainly something that uh, 
observer groups are aware of and um, and when you're building those partnerships, making sure that uh, there is other funding mechanisms that are contributing to um, those projects. So I think that there's definitely a range of um, there's definitely a range in the amount of effort and the way that the observers have engaged with Indigenous people. And with the permanent participants, I think that it has certainly been um, part of the permanent participant agenda to ensure that things like Indigenous knowledge um, is incorporated into projects. And so it's been a way for, I think, us as permanent participants to um, ensure that what's happening um, within our communities is being uh, recognized and acknowledged and how, um, how we can better inform the science as Indigenous people. And that's just kind of been one of the things that the permanent participants has, have tried to move forward and to ensure that we are cognizant of um, as the Arctic Council body. Me, did Thanks, we cover Gail. the? Yeah, Gail, do you have any comment on that? Um, you know, just that it's nice to finally be recognized by the Arctic Council as um, worthy of sitting uh, beside those uh, members because, you know, we're all one people uh, when it comes right down to it. Um, I do want to say that I have a concern about, you know, some of uh, the entities that have kind of latched on to. Uh, both the Arctic Council and the Arctic Economic Council and their efforts to um, possibly unduly influence um, the indigenous people of uh, the Arctic. Um, you know, we, and, and also I don't think, for example, that a country like um, China, which uh, calls itself a near Arctic state, um, I, I really think that that is an, a country that needs to be watched in terms of what it is doing or trying to do in the Arctic. Uh, recently, um, there was an effort in uh, my region of uh, the uh, Chinese group to purchase shoreside uh, property right on the Bering Strait. And I was pretty distressed about that. Um, uh, for one, because I don't believe that um, uh, China should be allowed to establish an Arctic presence. Um, that's my personal belief. That's not the uh, position of Bering Straits Native Corporation. Uh, but also uh, because of things that they are doing, uh, both in international waters, including claiming really large swaths of um, waters that um, house the uh, fisheries resources that they will need or do need to you know, feed their population. Uh, but also that, you know, I believe that really nothing great can come of um, any sort of uh, relationship or tie with uh, the Chinese government. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm going to throw out one last question and, and start with uh, Mike and Dave uh, on this. Um, you know, the Arctic Council, David mentioned earlier on, does not have um, D does does not have security issues per se and doesn't have trade issues and doesn't have fisheries issues. Um, but uh, one of the questions, because we do have general economic development issues, during this whole sanctions process, our, our closest allies in Asia, Japan and Korea, are buying huge new amounts of LNG from the Russian Arctic. Uh, there's quite a bit of cross-border investment there. Uh, China is, uh, you know, has been looking at strategic investments of the kind that Gail mentioned. And, and I guess the question I've got is how should the U.S. use the Arctic Council to kind of achieve its goals in, in big power competition without scrambling the comedy, uh, C-O-M-I-T-Y, the, 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 the friendliness of the Arctic Council process? And I uh, thought Mike, who's actively involved in the Munich Security Conference, and David would have some thoughts on that. Dave, do you want to take it from the Arctic Council perspective, and I'll talk about the security component of it? Sorry, I was muted, I was muted there for a second. Um, the Arctic, me, the Arctic Council, 
uh, has only an indirect role, I would say, to play in lowering um, tensions in the region. It's by doing the work, the cooperative work it does, by providing a, a venue, a place where um, Russia and the other seven can you know, find common ground, I think is the most valuable thing. And one of the problems, uh, to, to be candid, that a lot of the work of the Arctic Council is tied to climate change, the fact that the Arctic is warming as it is. Uh, it's not like the eight Arctic states alone could affect uh, the degree to which the Arctic is, is warming, at least not, not in most ways, it takes global effort. Um, but the fact that the U.S. has pulled out of the Paris Agreement and is not any longer, you know, at least on the international level, uh, taking the same posture on climate issues has itself created friction, not so much with Russia, frankly, uh, as, the, as, as the six other Arctic Council members for whom climate change remains a sort of mainstay of their foreign policy and a, and a focal point for their Arctic policy. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't know what the outcome of the election is going to be here in the United States, but it would be nice to find a way to sort of bridge that gap within the Arctic Council going forward. And that would help, I think, indirectly reduce tensions among, among the eight. But Mike could speak more effectively, I think, to prospects for dealing with great power competition in other ways outside the Arctic Council. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And Mead, I think that there's a number of things in your question. One was the, the future role, I think, of the Arctic Council. And as Dave has noted and written about, <clears throat> you know, there are some things the Arctic Council does very, very well. And we're looking at the opening of an ocean. So what does the future governance of the Arctic Ocean look like? And do we need to have some kind of organization that focuses on that aside from, aside from the Arctic Council? Uh, so there's that going on. Uh, I framed this as sort of the quickening of the Arctic. Two is we have an Arctic Economic Council looking at the economic issues. Um, Liza pointed out the importance of the permanent particip participants in the indigenous people of the North, they have interests, uh, you know, th their future lies in how this, the, the region is governed. Um, the, there are organizations like the Munich Security Conference that do focus on the transatlantic uh, alliance and have over the last three years facilitated a closed door Arctic security roundtable that, that we've been fortunate enough to help shape and facilitate. Uh, that's, that's a place where it's not mill to mill specifically, but it is, a lot of Arctic security issues happen at Munich. Um, so I think e each of these are, are trying to not struggle, but grapple with uh, and form frameworks for the multiple discussions happening in a very short period of time. The Arctic has become, as we all know, popular uh, for a lot of different reasons. And there isn't one singular structure to deal with the Arctic, uh, particularly uh, as Dave noted, you know, it, it has its flavor and its, its themes and its history, as does the AEC, as does organizations like the Munich Security Conference, which is the premier organization that, that looks at security-related issues, but mostly the Transatlantic Alliance, which includes NATO. Um, so I don't see the Arctic Council entertaining anytime soon, and in my opinion, nor should they, the hard security. There's, a, there's another component here that's come up at Munich and other transatlantic and security conferences, and that has been the whole issue of civil security, right? Security is just not the hard security. It is also the civil security, the search and rescue, the food security, um, oil spill response, all of those things. And so I think what we're experiencing here is not just the quickening of the issues related to the Arctic, mostly driven by climate change, but also the way in which the national international communities try to provide governance and structures to deal with all of these. So I think our challenge is, the, I mean, I think the very reason for this, this discussion is how how best does the state of Alaska, how do we prioritize our strategies and, our, and what we look forward to in terms of what our future looks like? And how does that fit, not just our national strategy, but also how does it fit in these international organizations and how can we inform those organizations to the betterment of our, of our own state? Um, and so I was kind of hoping, and I think we've teased out, there might be some uh, recommendations from these three speakers as to at least, if not what to do, because uh, no one can tell the state what to do, but what are those things that the Commonwealth North should think about in terms of advancing for either an AEC agenda, what should we advance our own State Department uh, and priority list on, on things that the state of Alaska would like to have forward, and through folks like me and others, 
what are the international components that go along with that? Um, particularly the defense. I mean, you know, the national security, defense, homeland security is very important to us up here in the state. And so what are those things that, that the state and Commonwealth and North members would like to move forward on in trying to shape those future agendas as well? So I'm not sure we've answered the question, but you certainly have teased out these on ramps and off ramps of issues that um, it'd be nice to have Commonwealth North's thoughts on. Mike, thanks. And uh, as I hand this back to Juanetta to announce our next programs, let me just uh, say that the, the speakers here have done a fantastic job today explaining the current Arctic Council. We've talked about a lot of different uh, ways. David, thank you very much in your initial outline for covering ways to get the state of Alaska more involved. And uh, last week, uh, we had a kind of a, dis a, a discussion on an outline for the study group report. Uh, if you got that email, which, uh, which I hope you did, um, please send us any comments you've got, especially after hearing today's session on potential recommendations on improvement to the Arctic Council. Uh, uh, one of the other things in that outline was, was kind of a list of accomplishments in the last 10 years since Commonwealth North did a large report. And David, uh, with you on board, I just want to say that many of the big, big accomplishments on that list you had a lot to do with, especially the SAR agreement, the oil spill agreement, the science agreement. And for that, I'd just like to congratulate you again. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, let me pen the program back to Juanetta and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Great, thank you, Mead. Uh, just, uh, I have placed in the chat um, a couple of uh, upcoming sessions. Next week, October 7th, is uh, still tentative. We're still looking to confirm a, a couple of speakers for that. The topic is other models of international cooperation. There are a, a number of NGOs and quasi-governmental organizations that operate in the Arctic and um, some new emerging models. So that's the tentative topic for next week. October 14th, uh, we have a confirmed uh, panel of speakers for Powering Alaska's Arctic. We have Matt Bergen with uh, Kotzebue Electric Association, Ingemar Matthiasen with Northwest Arctic Borough, and uh, uh, Rob Royce with Launch Alaska will be talking about some new models for uh, community energy. On October 21st, we have a panel on Arctic fisheries that will feature Steve McLean, who's the Arctic fishery plan manager with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, Stephanie Madsen with Atsea Processors Association, and um, Simon Kaneen with uh, uh, Norton Sound Economic Development Corporation, the Community Development Quota Organization for, for the consortia of communities in, in the uh, um, Norton Sound region. And then uh, we have a couple of tentative invitations out to international uh, neighbors to join us for future sessions. And um, with that, I think we'll, uh, just a, a brief reminder, if you, um, uh, we will have a, this recording as well as the uh, slide decks that have been shared posted on the Arctic Policy Study Group webpage. That link is provided at the beginning of the chat. Please look for that. I believe that you can also, using the more menu, uh, download uh, everything that's in uh, chat to save to your desktop. So um, uh, again, look for the file icon in the uh, bottom of the chat window to, to do that. Uh, we have shared some other links to some of the references that were discussed today, and uh, we'll provide those on the study group website as, as well. So with that, let me thank our, our speakers, Gail Schubert, Liza Mack, David Balton, and Mike Sfrega. Um, so thanks to you all and uh, appreciate your uh, continuing partnership and invite everybody to continue to participate by signing up for uh, notices on the Arctic Policy Study Group if you're not already on the mailing list. With that, thanks to everybody for joining us today and I uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks everybody.